fee for the invitation. Uh, Ms. Patty makes associate dean as well in undergraduate studies. So the dean mentioned I, I am indeed a graduate of the University of Texas. In fact, I'm a second generation Longhorn. My father came here as well many, many years ago. And uh, so pretty much when I was born, right, it was either I was going to come here or they're going to kick me out of the house. So it was one or the other. And I chose, I think I chose wisely. And in fact, I, I, I'm, I'm such a, a proud Longhorn that I did everything in my power to be able to find my way back as a professor. I, to, to your point, I, I never really could have imagined. Um, in fact, as a math major, I remember sitting in class over at uh, RLM, y'all know RLM, right, some of y'all? You probably avoided like the plague like I did. Uh, I wish there was a, a UGS kind of situation when I was an undergrad <coughs> about <coughs> many years ago, I won't say how many. But what, what, what really struck me in those experiences in those classrooms was, I remember actually thinking, like, there's no way I could ever do that, like, be that person in front, be a professor. And certainly, when we're talking about math classes at a place like UT Austin, you can imagine, and then to be a math major taking on these sort of high theory math and whatnot. But I remember actually thinking that, that there's no way I could ever do what they do. And, uh, and in fact, I, I don't do what they do. I'm not a math professor. I'm a professor in the College of Education, and particularly in the Department of Education Administration. So coming back home, because this is very much home for me, the experience was such that you know, I had an opportunity to reconnect with so many of the folks that, I, that helped to prepare and mentor me, in many ways helped to reprogram uh, me from getting out of that mindset that I could never do that because, hey, here I am. And in fact, this is my ninth year as a, as a professor, I'm an associate professor, now tenured, and, uh, which means they can't ever get rid of me. So now they're stuck with me, oh well. Um, and in fact, uh, I'm, I'm truly honored to be able to, to have this opportunity to engage with students. Any opportunity uh, outside of the classroom that I could do that, I absolutely jump on. So thank you again for the invitation. So, you know, what am I here to talk about today? Hopefully something that, for some of you, may be a new topic. Some of you may be completely foreign to it. Some of you might actually wonder what the big deal is about boys or, or males of color, because there's a lot of noise out there right now. I'm going to talk a lot about that. And I hope that along the way you, you feel free to interrupt ask questions. In fact, it's not an interruption. This is meant to be an engagement. So I'm going to throw a lot of stats at you. I'm going to throw a lot of anecdotes as well. But, but ultimately, what I want to do is have this conversation with you, because ultimately, the, the work that I'm engaged in uh, as a professor here is, is to spark dialogue and spark questions, because there's a lot of important questions that we have to ask about what's going on with our boys. And in particular, in a state like Texas, given the demographic reality that we find ourselves in, where more than half of all public school students are from Hispanic backgrounds, primarily Mexican or Mexican origin, Mexican American. Uh, I'm fourth generation Mexican American, by the way. Born and raised in the Rio Grande Valley, South Texas. Uh, right on the border, literally a mile or two away from the Rio Grande River. And, and so a lot of these issues clearly resonate for me on a personal level. But I've been fortunate as a professor to be able to pursue these passions in the form of my research agenda. So I'm excited to be able to share that with you because this work is about sharing with our community about what this important work could yield for uh, the kind of I'm going to start with this question, all right? And so I'm going to throw some images up here and have you guys, this is kind of the audience participation part of this, all right? So who are Latino males? I'll throw this image up there. What do you all think of immediately? Don't be shy. What are some words? So some of you all are big fans of this video game. I know so, what are some words that immediately come to mind about what this image may represent? Latos Say again? Latos Locos. Latos Locos, all right. Well, we have to translate that for folks who uh, <laughs> may not know what that means. But yeah, all right. So, maybe some of that gangbanger mentality. Uh, what else do we, we see in this image? What does it portray? What kind of uh, message maybe? Say again? Thug, all right. Criminal, criminal element. You know, when I, when I have an opportunity to, to work with a lot of young boys um, and talk to young boys, primarily middle school, high school, I start with this slide and I talk about, you know, everybody's like, oh yeah, I know what that is, you know, I'm a big fan of the video game, and blah, blah, blah. But then I start asking, well, we start unpacking it a little bit, what, what, what do the images represent? What does that say about you if you happen to look like the, the, the figure represented here? And then I say, well, what do you think is behind this? What's behind this? Well, it's a company, you know. What do you think that company is doing with these images? Well, they're making money off of it. Right, then you start seeing a few kind of eyebrows start raising. Well, what do you mean? Well, they're profiting off of the exploitation of certain images of young men of color in our society. 
Now I really got their attention, and hopefully yours. So I begin here because these are the kind of images that I think we're bombarded with. We don't even think about it. We consume these subconsciously. But they feed and they perpetuate, I think, certain images and stereotypes, whatever you want to call it, about this particular element, quote unquote, within our communities. And then, unfortunately, these incidents kind of end up showing themselves in media, they get over sensationalized, and maybe even co-opted. And so you have unfortunate events around the country, right, that, that, that they ultimately manifest themselves in. And the way that young males of color can be overly criminalized uh, in, within our communities, whether it's by uh, police or whether it's by other entities, other law enforcement, or for that matter, just the average security guard out on the night patrol, um, i.e. George Zimmerman. Right? So we can think about these images, and they may seem innocuous at first, and we, don't, we just consume them without even thinking about it. But actually, we start peeling the layers away, and there's a lot more there. Let me throw a few more images at you, right? So this guy right here is a dreamer. I have to talk about dreamers because, yeah, for my money, they're some of the most courageous young people in our society right now. Think about this for a second, right? So dreamers, and we define dreamers as, you know, young people who are undocumented, who are here because their parents brought them here, quote unquote, illegally, right? So they're undocumented young people, and, you know, what, what characterizes particularly, because there's a lot of folks that are undocumented, there's about 11 million or so in this country, give or take. But a dreamer is not just somebody who's undocumented, but is actually willing to take the risk of outing themselves, right? unafraid and undocumented. There's a whole hashtag movement around that. Right? They're willing to take that risk at the risk of actually being deported or certainly pushed out of their schools or their communities and certainly thought of as, as a prize. But they're willing to take that risk right, upon themselves and, and with the understanding that they may not benefit whatever immigration, immigration reform changes come up their activism. So for, again, for my thinking, there's some of the most courageous young people there is out there. I don't know how many of us would be willing to take that kind of risk, given the uncertainty of that activism at the end of the day. What about this guy? You all know this guy down here? El Machete? So my, how many of y'all seen the movie? Some of y'all know what I'm talking about, right? So El Machete, Robert Rodriguez, local filmmaker. All right, this is Danny Trejo. He's an actor. but. You know, I put his image up here because he kind of represents a certain hyper-masculine, machismo kind of image that is out there about Latino men in our communities and our society, right? And he kind of fits the bill, and the guy's, you know, he's type guy. He's a hell of a guy. He's a really nice guy in real life, right? But clearly he's, you know, he's mean mugging here. He's got a certain persona as an actor that he clearly profits off of, and certainly filmmakers and producers and all that recognize that, right? So he f fits that image pretty to a T. What about this guy? Y'all know that guy? If you don't know who he is, he certainly danced to his music, right? Mr. Pitbull, aka Mr. Worldwide, aka Mr. 305, what else? He calls himself all kinds of things, right? He's got all kinds of nicknames for himself, right? So Cuban immigrant, grew up in the streets of, uh, of Miami or South Florida, and so there's a lot of stuff about him and his music and his craft and his success. As a, as, a, as a rap artist, hip hop artist, that, uh, that we see, and a lot of people criticize, right? Well, you know, he's another guy who's kind of full of himself, a little arrogant, a little, you know, puts off that vibe that maybe rubs certain people the wrong way. And yes, there are other critiques about his music and his image, his misogynist and all this, and, and we certainly shouldn't neglect that. But there are other parts of his story that aren't as obvious to the typical person, the fact that he does a lot and has done a lot in reinvesting in his own community, the low-income communities um, in the streets of Miami where he grew up in the barrios, right? And, and in fact, he does so much of it behind the scenes we don't ever hear about. So yet another image, though, of a Latino male who's, quote, made it. Uh, we don't necessarily think of him in that way, but he's truly proud of his heritage and his community and has sought to do all he can with his resources to, to revitalize wherever he can. So what about this guy? This is yet another Latino male, right? You might see him or someone like him, right, over standing in the corner by a Home Depot or somewhere else in this country. Certainly you see him in Austin. And in fact, when we think about um, a lot of the rhetoric of, of Latinos in, in America often are with this kind of idea in mind, that, that, that they're here, quote, illegally, that they're not here in any kind of legal status, and the fact that they're breaking the law and coming in. 
You look at this image and I'm just staring at this dog. This dog wants not, no part of this fence, I'll tell you that. Right? But think about what that signifies. I mean, yes, this kind of thing happens all the time, clearly. Right? People literally climbing over walls to find just even the ounce of prospect of a, of a better life, a better opportunity for them and their families. So, I, I finish with these guys. I mentioned, but I forgot, I skipped over. You know who these guys are? Two other Latino male brothers. Some of you might know, right? So they're, they're a little bit beyond our generation's time, perhaps. But this is uh, Fidel Castro and his brother Raul, who've been you know, leading uh, the dictatorship in Cuba, the island nation of Cuba, for going on 50 plus years now. And uh, yes, the Obama administration has recently uh, loosened some of the uh, sanctions that we've had in place for that long. But these are yet another form of, of sort of Latino males within this hemisphere that have been shaping uh, the politics uh, around uh, a variety of different issues related to immigration and nationalism and socialism, etc. Now, what about these Castro brothers? <laughs> these are the Castro brothers I like a little bit more. Do you all know these guys? Yes, no? All right, so if nothing else, I want you to walk away from, from today understanding who these two young men are. My, my view vanguard of young Latino leaders in this country. Um, on, the, on the left here is Julian Castro, former mayor of San Antonio, currently secretary of the Housing and Urban Development uh, Office in D.C. in the Obama administration, uh, the youngest ever to hold that role. He's only 41 years old, you know, because he's a day older than I am, so there you go. Um, his brother Joaquin Castro is a U.S. congressman from San Antonio, now in his second term and about to be reelected again. So both these guys grew up on the west side of San Antonio. How many of y'all from San Antonio? Raise your hand. Anybody? Maybe a couple folks. So west side, you know what I'm talking about in terms of the west side? It's the barrio. It's you know where a high concentration of poor folk are and, and so many other incidents around violence. Although things are changing, that's a good old gentrification for you. But they grew up on the west side, they were raised by a single mom, Rosie Costa who works at a community college there. Rosie was an activist, part of the Chicano movement of the 70s and 80s there in San Antonio. So she raised these two young boys to go to Stanford. You may have heard of it. They went to Harvard Law, both of them, twin brothers. Right? And now they are doing what they're doing. And in fact, in the case of Julian, he's going to be, or he might be, on the ticket with the uh, eventual Democratic nominee. Some people suggest that maybe if it, if it is Hillary Clinton, she may select him as, as her uh, vice presidential candidate. Right? The clinton Castro ticket, believe me, there's a lot of people out there pushing hard. And, and so, the point is that these all represent a variety of different Latino male images, whether you are aware of them or not, that are out there kind of shaping public opinion and perception about who Latino males are. So, based on that, you've heard me talk about how these images shape the way we, we make sense of the world, right? the way we think about certain people. So I want you to think about this thought then, that the manner in which we might uh, define or frame a particular issue not only determines its stakeholders, but also can determine how we decide to act. Right? And so narratives or framing devices are really powerful things, because right? they help establish what we think is normal, some common set of behaviors, about a particular group of people or about a history. Right? If you grew up in Texas, you took Texas history, you've been fed a certain narrative about sort of the mythology of Texas history. Right? But do we ever unpack beyond that and we just sort of consume what we were told in seventh grade Texas history? Um, there's a lot of narrative narrating that goes on that tells these grand or universal stories that can help us make sense of ourselves or others. Right? So you might imagine there's a lot of narratives about young men of color in our communities, in our society, and also about Latino males that we're going to talk about. So narratives are also important because they give birth to framing devices, things like theories and hypotheses. You know, as a researcher, these are the kind of things we, we do with our work, right? We take these theories and hypotheses and test them out. Ultimately, they can influence how we think, how we talk, and how we act. So narratives are pretty powerful things, right? Are you all with me on that? Whether we realize it or not, we often buy into all kinds of different narratives about the world around us. In many ways, because it just helps to simplify things for us, or certainly makes sense of them. Well, 
what are the narratives for Latino males? How do we frame the lives of, of Latino males either in schools or in society? Well, for one, we t often talk about males being in a state of crisis, especially within education. There's a lot of this kind of alarmist language that's often used to describe what's going on with, with boys, particularly boys of color. We talk about Latino males being in danger, uh, meaning that they're literally disappearing, that they're somehow damaged culturally, that some aspect of their culture is injuring or inhibiting their forward progress in life, is causing them to not value school, not value education, so that somehow the culture is damaged rather than the systems around these young boys. Right? We talk about them as missing and vanishing. That's another narrative that's out there. But where are they? Well, we look at our college campuses, and that's what I study. I study higher education issues. Right? We, we see that uh, for Latinos, you know, more and more males are not making it through high school and into college relative to females, relative to, to even other male groups. I'm, I'm going to show you some data to kind of uh, illustrate that a little bit more. We also talk about them as needing to be saved, sometimes saved from themselves or maybe even saved, saved from us, right? that somehow they're posing a danger and therefore we need to push them out. In fact, if we can't save them, Maybe we can find ways to identify how their behavior is deviant. Do we know what we mean by deviant? Deviating from whatever normal behavior might be. And as such, we've got to fix them because they're broken. We've got to modify their behavior towards respectability. Right? So we think about these things. These are all the different kinds of narratives that are out there about, I mean, we can almost insert other groups of people in here too. We can, we can think about LGBT communities, we can think about black males, low-income people, illegal immigrants, right? all the different ways that we tell certain narratives about people around us. Well, for Latino males, and this is why we're here tonight to talk about this issue, you know, what I would submit to you is that all these add up to this pathology and how we might understand black Latino males. And this pathology can lead to very, very dangerous narratives. Who, we might term them deficit, meaning that we're looking for fault in the young boy because something's wrong with the boy. Something's wrong with the boy. His culture, his lack of family or parental involvement, his lack of, of caring about education, right? There's a deficit there somewhere that's missing. There's something wrong with it. Instead of asking, what's wrong with the system and the structure around these boys that is broken? You see how that's different? These set of de deficit narratives, folks, we all kind of buy into and subscribe you know, without even thinking about it. You know, that's the whole point of a narrative, of these framing devices, that they allow us to kind of check out in terms of our critical thinking for the most part. And I'm not overgeneralizing saying every last one of you, but I'm saying for the most part we do. We buy into certain narratives. Well, we buy into the narrative that, you know, the Longhorns had a pretty bad football season, but next year's going to be better. Right? That's the narrative we all buy into. What is the data? You know? Look, I'm a lifelong long fan, I'm very optimistic, but I'm also realistic, right? Point is, we buy into these narratives, and somehow narratives become stories. They can become gospel, right? They turn into theories and hypotheses, so they're dangerous. We start buying into them too much, and so I want us to think about this as kind of the opening set of thoughts around uh, Latino boys or Latino males. So here's the other reason I think you should care about this issue. That there's also a growing demographic imperative or reality. And I mentioned that earlier, that in Texas, right, we know half of, more than half now of all public school kids are Hispanic. Right? That's in the millions now. And you look at every corner of the state, and in fact, you can replicate it for California, for Florida, for all the big states, New York, Illinois, where the Latino community is driving the population growth and has been now for decades. I'm going to show you a little bit about this population growth here shortly. But the point here with this demographic rally is that it kind of underscores how more urgent it is for us to focus on boys, in particular boys of color, in the case I'm making tonight, Latino boys. Yes, sir? Um, would you say that it's society itself is putting pressure on these Latino males in high school and college age, or would you say that it's the Latino community itself is saying, hey, my brother didn't graduate high school, I didn't graduate high school, as opposed to the black or white community, saying, 
they sit outside of Home Depot, you know, they don't graduate high school. Do you think they put more pressure on themselves and just accept the fate, or do you think it's the outside view? That's a great question. Thank you for asking that question. Um, and that's exactly kind of the direction I was heading here. Um, because we don't want to let anybody off the hook. These are very complex issues. We can't just say, well, it's society's fault, you know, society's to blame, right? Because there are clearly internal pressures. I'm going to talk a little while about the kind of pressures that many young men deal with. And I, I, I believe that, that men in this world, a lot of men in this world, are leading these lives of quiet desperation, right? Because we don't give men permission, especially in the Western world, we don't give men permission to emote in certain ways. In fact, we police each other's behavior as men, don't we? Think about the way that we use um, hate speech when talking to each other about don't be gay, that's weak, you're a P word. Right? We use this kind of policing to police each other about what it means to be a man. And for Latino male and African American males, right, there's a yet, yet another layer of element there that not only is their identity as men tied to sort of maintaining a certain sort of posture with other males, but there's also the other element, perhaps even more dangerous and invasive, and this is part of the psyche that some of us who study masculinity issues try to, try to really unpack. And that's the element of giving each other permission to not ask for help. That's yet another way we police each other. If you go ask for help, man, that's weak, right? That, that's, that's an embarrassment, that's a shame. And for, for males, I mean, so many males I think, and that's one of the things we don't ever talk about publicly, which is why I appreciate y'all being with me on this journey tonight. You know, males, we don't, we don't acknowledge the insecurities that we all bring to the table. And guess where a lot of those insecurities will manifest themselves? When you're put into a hostile situation, like a college campus or even a high stakes sort of high school environment, because the last thing you want anybody to think is what? That you're stupid or you're dumb. So what do a lot of young men do? They don't ask questions. They sit in the back. I often tell men, guess what? If you sit in the back, that's where people are going to think you belong. Right? But we, we're, we give males, other males, permission to sort of act and, and follow these scripts and perform our gender in these ways. And, and that's really getting into the, the psyche of men. So I don't want to let males off the hook. Right? But there's also all kinds of other elements that I'm going to get to that, that are perpetuating these kinds of outcomes for both. Yes, sir? Did you say that you think that because your generation is less aware of the issues that Absolutely. So there's, there's a lot of economic pressure. You asked about question, uh, pressure that exists. So there's a pressure that exists internally about our own identity as young men, what it means to be a, a male of color or a man in this society. And you have to fit certain scripts, and if you don't, you know, how that can you know, be problematic for, for, for young people. But then the other pressure is to fulfill certain obligations to family. You know, and, and I'm definitely generalizing now, but you know, you know that for, Lati for the Latino community, Latino culture is a strong affinity for family, right? And in particular for young men, if you're the, the oldest male in the household, the oldest son, let's say, you know, there's a strong expectation that you're going to join the workforce and help contribute to the family. I and mean, that's a very real thing. Most Latinos in this country are from working class backgrounds, and that's just the reality of, the, of our experience, right? That there's a really strong pressure. And most of these young men are not, don't, are not like me, don't have a father who graduated from UT Austin in 1965. You know, most are either have immigrant parents, maybe second, third generation, uh, probably didn't go to college, if at all. Right? And so these are the kinds of trends that, that ultimately come to bear on the decisions that young Latino males have to make, that weighing and balancing 
fulfilling those obligations to family, to their own identity as young men, which is tied very closely, by the way, to fulfilling those commitments to family, versus foregoing that. The opportunity cost of going to college is increasingly higher, as you all know. Right? If you, if you remove yourself from the workforce, which these young men are already predisposed to do, want to do, and are expected to do, that's prime earning years. That's the way young, young males are looking at it. Prime earning years that I'm giving up to go to college for the expectation of a possible better job. Maybe, maybe not. And these are the kind of decision points that so many young men are having to go through. And maybe it's not unique to Latinos, but what is unique is this added to a burden, or you can look at it as a burden, you can also look at it as a really enriching part of the culture, right? That's part of the deficit narrative approach, that, that there is this expectation to, to work for the family in one way or another. Yes, sir? Right, so that's a really big, and that's one of the things we're gonna, we're gonna talk about here, that there is a severe lack of positive role models, particularly positive male role models in the lives of, uh, of young men, particularly young men of color, Latino and African American males. So in this country, I'm gonna throw some stats at you real quick. We know something like 60%, or close to 60% of all black children are growing up in a home, household without a biological father. Doesn't mean there isn't a father figure, because a lot of times it's a female in the household who's serving that dual role. Either the mother or some other generation, you know, grandmother, aunt, etc. For Latino families, it's not much different. It's just upwards of 50 to 45 to 50 percent are growing up in homes without a biological father that's, that's consistently present. So let's just start there and start thinking about this idea of the male role model. Forget if they're positive or negative, just having a male in the household. Right? Is, is, a, is a big challenge. So society, I mean, how do you take that on? That's huge. That, that's talking about a whole host of other social issues that we don't have time to address all in one night, or for that matter, one year, right? But that's the reality. And so how can we find creative ways right, to put more positive role models in the lives of these young boys when it matters most, when they still are influential, or when they still are impressionable? Right, when they can still latch on to the idea of a positive role model. Because young people are resilient. Young people will find somebody to latch on to as a role model, won't they? It might be that drug pusher down the street. It might be uh, the gang leader who's going to you know, jump you in. They'll find somebody. And young people have to have that, that developmental uh, influence in their life. And if they're lacking a, a strong core at home, it doesn't have to be a mother-father you know, nuclear family approach. But the point is, if they're lacking that kind of positive role model in their life, they're going to find it somewhere. They're going to find that influence somewhere. And for too many of our young men, I think we find they find those influences elsewhere, which also leads them into this trajectory, the school-to-prison pipeline that, that, that a lot of us do uh, have written about and talk about. So I'm going to show you a little bit of data here just to give you a little bit of broader context about the demographics. So we think about demographics, I'm talking about population, right? So for those of you who are not sociologists or whatnot, we're talking about population and numbers. So in 2012, we know there's, and actually it's now up to close to 55 million as of 2015. 55 million Latinos in this country. But uh, we also know that this category of Hispanic is like super ambiguous. I mean, it's everybody. And look at this list of people. You've got Mexican origin at the very top. That's almost two thirds of all people in this country that we call Hispanic origin. Puerto Rican, Cuban, Salvadoran, on and on and on. I mean, we even have some European categories in here or pseudo-European, as they call it, Latin American country, South American. So, I mean, Spaniard is up here, Argentinian, I mean, on and on, Chilean. For those of you who've ever traveled the Americas, I mean, I don't have much in common with any Chilean out of America. Right? And so, or for that matter, I don't have much in common with a kid that grew up over in Galena Park, North Shore, on the east side of Houston. Right? That's a completely different experience. Or in South Pasadena, outside of Houston. Little Mexico or Monterrey, whatever they call that part of Houston. So, point is that there's a lot of diversity that gets masked, and I'm just as guilty of it because as a social scientist, we gotta often play to the common denominator here, the lowest common denominator, and people aren't interested in all this variation. They just want one compelling narrative. There's that word again. 
tell me the bottom line. I don't want to hear about Mexican origin this and Cuban that and Puerto Rican this or that. You know, so in many ways, this term has just become a term of convenience, right? the term Hispanic, Latino. But there's a lot of diversity here. And then you overlay immigrant status, and you talk about a whole other layer. So let's understand that, that when we talk about Latinos in this country, we're talking about a lot of different kinds of people. All right, so that said, when we follow the growth of this community, the people who are labeled Hispanic, 1980, some of you were not born yet. I was already born. I was six years old in 1980. You saw that historically this, this community has been concentrated in the Southwest, right? Is that any coincidence? Oh, of course not. We I mean, you know that that's obviously on the border with Mexico. And you saw pockets in South Florida, up in the East Coast, up in the Midwest, Chicago, Detroit, um, et cetera. Now, I'm going to fast forward to 1990, to 2000, to 2006, to 2010. That's a lot of growth in a 30 year span, is it not? And, and you know, I, I use this chart sometimes and I say, well, what does it look like? Some people say, it looks like the virus spread. Right? And that's another narrative that's out there, is it not? I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not throwing out, you know, complete, uh, you know, absurdities here. People do think that, clearly. There's a, there's a very strong anti-immigrant uh, move in this country, and it has been fueled by all kinds of folks. I and mean, I don't need to tell you who they are, you know who they are. So, the point is that the community is spreading, and it's spreading to places where historically there's never been a critical mass of Latinos. So we're talking about the deep south. Look at Carolina, the state of North Carolina, right? up and down the eastern seaboard, all over the Midwest, Nebraska, Missouri, Iowa, right? All these meat packing plants, and, uh, meat packing plants, and chicken poultry plants, and you know, fields, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that are drawing people left and right. Arkansas, you know what? The fastest growing cities uh, in this in this country right now. The fastest growing Latino communities in this country are primarily in the South. The city of Atlanta, the city of New Orleans, you don't think of Latinos living in any of those cities, but they have the fastest rate of growth among the Latino community in this country. And in fact, between this 12 year span, these are the states that drove where the population grew the fastest. So, what's happening as a result of this is that you, you have these non traditional areas of the country where people don't know what the hell to make about all this influx, this virus that's spreading, of Latinos coming to their community. They don't know what to make of it. Imagine school systems, school, you know, educators, bilingual programs, you know, on and on. They're, they're not equipped. I tell a lot of students over in the College of Ed, hey, you want a job for life? Go move to Iowa. Go move to Tennessee. They're hiring people left and right who are bilingual, right? who are, have the ability to be bilingual, bicultural, engage these fast growing communities that school systems and communities are simply not currently equipped to do. So the other thing that's that's the reality about this growth is that it's very young. Right? So the median age in this country for people in the United States is 37 years old. You all know about you know median, right? You understand what that is? So the halfway point, half of the population is older than 37, the other half is younger than 37. We're talking about that in stack times, are we not? So, for Latinos in this country, that median age is 27. A full 10 years of difference. I mean, that's, that's a lot. Right? That's why you have this other reality in Texas where more than half of public school kids are not Hispanic. Right? So, they're young. And in fact, every year an estimated 600,000 Latinos in this country are turning 18 years old. And just to put that into perspective, that's equal to the size of the state of Vermont, or North Dakota. Every year, these many Latinos are turning 18 years old. Every year, these many Latinos, up to these many Latinos, are eligible to register to vote. Because most of them, the great overwhelming majority of these kids are US citizens. Right? So now you understand why maybe the two major parties starting to get, you know, why the Latino community is starting to get their attention in more significant ways. All right, so what about higher ed trends? Well, we know that in the last uh, decade or so, that the share of immediate entry to college, these are high school grads going right to college. 
Um, we know that for Hispanic high school graduates that are going right to college, that proportion is going up and up, which is great. That means, you know, people are getting the message about post-secondary education being a great pathway to, to opportunity, right? And we see, in fact, the general upward trend for just about all the, the big racial ethnic groups that I have up here. Now, the problem is, and this is where, I, where my work comes in, is that, that males are not keeping pace with females when it comes to the other end of the pipeline, finishing college. So we look at the bachelor's degree attainment rates, we see that for, for Latino males and females, it was around 1990 or so, right around the time I started going to college, that these two trend lines began to diverge. And so now Hispanic females are outgaining males in terms of the production of bachelor's degrees. The truth is I can redo this exact same chart for any other racial ethnic group because it exists across all groups. It's not unique to Hispanics or Latinos. In fact, I can almost do it for every other socioeconomic strata as well. Low income, middle income, affluent, you name it. Maybe except for the highest levels of affluence. Because it's a broader social phenomenon that's going on here around boys and education. And, and so, Yes, we're here to talk about Latino males because there's this demographic urgency about it, and that's kind of what I often talk about. But it's also a broader social phenomenon that's at work. So I want to share here in Texas so we can bring it a little bit closer to home. In Texas, we follow eighth graders pretty well. And in 1996 to 98, when we looked at those eighth graders, some of you in this room were eighth graders back then, right? We see hand if you're an eighth grader doing that. Okay, so maybe not these folks, but over there. <laughs> so that cohort, we follow those kids 11 years later. All boys in the state of Texas who are in public middle schools, right, are followed 11 years later. Only 60% have earned some kind of credential, what we call a degree, right? An associates, a certificate from a trade school, a bachelor's, whatever. Any kind of degree. Any kind of post-secondary education is a credential. Only 16%, that's about one out of six. For young women from that age cohort, it's not much better. 24%, about one out of four. Right? So they're both kind of depressing numbers. I mean, this is 11 years later, and we're talking about people in their mid to late 20s that you, know, you would hope have progressed as a state. To me, this is a huge commentary on the failure of schooling systems and structures in the state of Texas. I mean, if we can't stand by these kind of data, then what the heck are we doing? Well, we can't find ways to explain it. But let me, let me get even more depressed, depressing for a second, right? Because if we disaggregate from boys, look at those numbers for Latino boys and African American boys in Texas, that same age cohort, tracking those same 108th graders, only nine out of those 100 have earned a credential that we out, only eight, these African-American male eighth graders. So I have this question, right? That's 100 plus 100, that's 200 black and Latino boys. All right, so what do we got, 91 and 93. What the heck are the, the rest of the 184 out of those 200? What's happening? Well, that's really at the heart of what the work I do is engaged in. What is happening to our boys? And is it the boys' fault? Back to that deficit narrative. Is it the boys' fault or is it something else? Or a combination, because it is very complex. Well, if we think about the, the ways that we study schools, we know that schools where these boys tend to be enrolled in, over-enrolled in, are under-resourced. Right? We have a broken school finance system in the state of Texas, you may have heard. And it's been like that, by the way, for decades. We're simply not funding our school districts as equitably as we should, in my opinion. Um, we know that a lot of these schools where these boys are at have novice teachers, high teacher turnover, because nobody wants to go work there, high turnover in administrators. Right? So it's a very unstable schooling environment, right? I mean, some of you may have gone to these kind of schools, but the fact that you're at UT Austin, odds are you probably went to the school was not like this, right? So we know that boys of color are significantly overrepresented in the special education ranks. 
And this is, in fact, the phenomenon that, that the Department of Education has been tracking for over almost four decades, this phenomenon of overrepresentation or disproportionality. So it's been a problem for a long time, right? And we've been tracking it for a long time, and it's still a problem. These are systemic trends that we're getting at. You all with me, Paul? So what happens with boys in the early grade level, especially boys of color? We talked earlier about the, the fact that, you know, they don't necessarily come from homes where there's an engaged father and mother both present every day, right? And if there is, I bet you they're working two, three jobs. Not making excuses, that's the reality. So when you have a child in, the, let's say, second, third grade, those critical, impressionable years where kids are developing, the sense of self, right, their educational confidence, the name of the reading skill, literacy. And so if a teacher or an educator, I'm a former classroom teacher, folks. I'm, I'm speaking from, from the heart here, uh, from a family of educators. If a teacher sees a kid acting out in their classroom, right, if, if a counselor or an administrator, whoever, refers that kid for special testing and ultimately gets diagnosed in a certain category, well, this is the kind of story, if you will, the narrative that's happening over and over for a disproportionate number of black and Latino boys. They're pushed in particular to categories that are, you know, sort of the, the emotional or behavioral challenge categories. In, in my view, often that's a symptom of the failure of our, our teacher prep programs in this country, or, or for that matter, the entire apparatus around how we train teachers. We used to do it a lot at colleges like UT Austin, and now it's through all kinds of alternative certification programs and whatnot. So again, getting at a systemic issue rather than anything having to do with the boy himself, right? Not bailing anybody out, I'm just throwing it out there as yet another sort of trend here to follow along. We also know boys of color are overrepresented in school discipline. So in the categories like suspensions or expulsions or in-school suspension or whatnot, it doesn't matter what kind of data you're looking at, these are trends that have been in place now for, for many years. We know that Latino and African American boys, particular African American boys, much more likely to be pushed out and expelled from school. Even after controlling for similar offenses, even after controlling for the kind of discretionary violations that we actually track in this country. So you're telling me that when the adult professional, again, I'm a former educator, when the adult has an opportunity to interpret the school discipline policy in those categories, not when a kid brings a knife or a club to school, those are mandatory, but when there's a discretion of the adult professional to decide whether to suspend a kid, expel a kid, you name it, in those categories, boys of color are significantly overrepresented. Again, is that a failure of the boy? Or do we need to rethink how we, how we do school discipline policies in our country, in our schools? If I can add it this way, you guys ever get sick when you're in K-12, like in high school, you're out for a whole week? Most of you guys are AP, honors, all that, I'm sure you know. You wouldn't be here, right? So imagine you missed that whole week, and maybe that was you. You came back, you know, 10 days later, how long? I mean, you were way behind, right? Way behind, even if it were two days, especially in this day and age, when you all taking three, four, five AP courses at once. You're way behind. So you know how this adds up. When boys of color are suspended at the rates they are, when they have this other phenomenon that we call chronic absenteeism, that they're, they're, they're absent more than 10% of all school days, at rates higher than any other group, that adds up on average, on average, on any given year, any given year, it adds up to an extra 10 days of school that these boys are missing. Boys of color. So forget that illness you had for a day or two. Imagine being gone 10 days. That's an entire unit in certain courses. That's a third of a six week semester, right? And you add that over the course of 12 years of formal education. You do the math, now you're talking about an entire school year or close to it that they've missed. So these actions, these decisions that, that are well intended, right? Because I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, I'm just saying, the structures and systems and policies that we have around these boys that we think are actually helping, maybe are not helping like we think they are. Maybe we need to rethink the entire narrative that these kids are illiterate, that these boys don't want to learn, they're just acting out, they're misbehaving, they're disrespectful to teachers, I mean, you name it. So the last piece here, yet another 
part of this other conversation is you know the teacher ranks, right? And in, in this country, something like eighty-five percent of the teacher workforce is female. It used to be um, so that means what fifteen percent are males. It used to be double that about thirty years ago. It used to be about seventy percent female, thirty. Years. So the, the teaching profession in this country has become increasingly feminized, and, and so we have yet another phenomenon. And I talk about this often with, with teacher groups. You know, why is it that males don't want to go work with young kids? Well, think about the social stigma that we subscribe to. Adult men want to work with little kids. I mean, do we automatically think that is sincere? As a society, I'm talking about. What is the narrative? Is that word again? There's stigma around. There's social stigma. And it's anchored in pedophilia, it's anchored in sexuality, it's anchored in all these other ugly things that we don't like to talk about, but it's in there. And so we're sending messages, maybe implicitly, to adult men who actually have a sincere desire to work with young kids, that you shouldn't go into teaching. There's that stigma, yet again, that narrative that's driving all these decisions. Yet again, another artifact of the system and structure rather than that kid and what's wrong with that kid. So in a lot of ways, we've got to rethink the entire question, not only what is happening to our boys, what's happening around these boys. And there's so much more we can dive into. And I know this stuff is kind of heavy and sobering. I promise we're going to finish somewhere a little bit happier, right? So we kind of bring all these different narratives together for Latino boys, because that's why I study. But I talked about the demographic imperative. You get in the sense now that there's a lot happening in this community. I get it, Victor, it's growing, it's growing. But it's also young, and it's growing in states where traditionally Latinos haven't been. There's a broader sort of urgency around Hispanic educational success, partly driven by people being worried that, that the, the community is growing so much. Obviously, there's also this growing boy crisis for boys of color. And then yet another sort of narrative around we just need to continue to close the gaps, right? There's these gaps in educational achievement and attainment in the state of Texas. For 15 years, we're committed to this mantra of closing the gaps, and now it's something else. Now it's called 60 by 30. The point is that this has been a perennial issue now for some time, and yet these disparities remain. All right, so what are we doing in response? So this is the fun part, because I get to talk about that we're not simply subscribing to this kind of doom and gloom, depressing kind of data points, and you know, indictment of the entire structure around these boys. We're doing something positive about it. Right? So about five, six years ago, uh, I started working with, uh, with Dr. Gregory Benson. He's the vice president here in the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement. He invited me, of, me to be a faculty fellow with DDCE. Been honored to be a faculty fellow now uh, through that time. And he said, why don't you bring something with you? Like, what's your research? What are you working on? That's why he invited me, because my research didn't align with the mission of DDCE. And I've been honored to be able to have this collaboration because in doing so, we've been able to anchor an entire infrastructure around Latino and African American boys and connect with partners that I never, in my wildest dreams, could have imagined working with as a, as a professor at UT Austin. All right, so starting over here with the research, this is what we got to do, right, as, a, as faculty members in order to get promoted and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you probably haven't figured out by now you will at this point, you know, you know, I'm really committed to not only my craft as an educator here, but, but also to ensure that the work I do is of value to my community. Otherwise, why the heck am I doing this? I can go work, I don't know, for some foundation or something else. So, being that that's in the core of what I am as a scholar, that the work be engaged, scholarship that's engaged in the community, you know, this opportunity, I mean, it literally you know, came from heaven above or somewhere to say, hey, why don't you come over here and let's start working on a project. So this is where we started Project Males, a student mentoring program. I know there's a couple of you here in the audience who are, are, uh, are part of Project Males right now. So we're really proud of this project. We've got about 90 undergraduate students at UT Austin. We start recruiting them as freshmen coming in the door. We train them during the sophomore year in a year-long service learning course. Um, just a you know, one unit, not for credit course. And then we start sending them out to schools. We're at seven schools now, three high schools, four middle schools, and Austin ISD. I'll tell you what, as a faculty member, and I got a few faculty colleagues here, I have no business starting any kind of program like this. Certainly that's not expected, 
And in fact, when I started this program, I was not tenured yet. I had people who, who had the best, best in mind for me saying, you know, don't do this. Why are you doing this? This is a waste of your time, literally. Well intended, who were advising me not to do this kind of work. We did it anyway, and thankfully things worked out. But this has sparked so much opportunity to partner, to attract amazing undergraduate students, graduate students that also work on the project. It's become this sort of research laboratory of sorts to test out our ideas on mentoring. Because we see these on the concept of mentoring, right? Project males, the, word, the letter M there stands for mentoring, mentoring to achieve Latino educational success. You asked me about positive role models. Right? So that's what we're seizing on. I mean, if we take out everything else, like the teacher workforce and school discipline, special ed, that's not me. I, look, I stay in my lane as a researcher. I know what I study, right? I'll let my other colleagues who do work in these areas continue to you know, beat the drum in these other areas. But I'm gonna focus on mentoring. I'm gonna focus on pathways to, to post-secondary education. That's what I do as a, as a, as a scholar. And, and so we have seized on the strategy of mentoring. That's the one contribution we know we can meaningfully offer. And that's also how we leverage the intellectual capital of the University of Texas for the benefit of our community. This is a win-win everywhere you look at it. Right? So we're finding creative ways to utilize the talent we already have around us. The fact that this campus is filled with 50,000 role models. Right? 50,000 plus role models. If you think about it that way, think about reframing it that way. So let's use that, those assets, right? Let's get more positive role models, because I bet you anything, a lot of these kids that we work with, these aren't the AP honors kids in these high schools, let me tell you. These are what we call tier two and three, they're on the bubble, all that. But more often than not, these kids don't, haven't even met anybody who's a student at UT Austin, right? They don't know what that is. They may not have even set foot on this campus, and they live in this community. Think about that for a second. All right, so the third piece of what we do here, uh, perhaps our most ambitious effort to date, is we started three years ago the statewide consortium focused on male students of color. This is where I was able to write some grants, get some grant money in to support this entire enterprise. But we have a great privilege of partnering with eight community colleges around the state of Texas. I haven't had a chance to talk to you about it, Dean, but we're in the Valley, we're in the Houston area, we're in Dallas, Tarrant County, we're in El Paso, we're in San Antonio, we're in Austin. Basically, we're all Latinos are. So, and all the African Americans are as well. We're targeting men of color, and let me say this, because I hadn't said it now, we do so unapologetically, right? Meaning, we have sort of this political capital right now to be able to do this work. One, because I have the freedom as an academic in UT Austin, but secondly, because there's a whole policy and educational imperative built around better educating Latino and African American boys both in the state of Texas and nationally. Right, I'm gonna talk here briefly about President Obama's My Brother's Keeper initiative. So, just to highlight all the different things we do with our students you know, throughout the year, we're on our fifth full year now of programming. And again, I have no business doing this. Like, I'm, not, I'm not an administrator, I'm just a faculty member in the quality of education, but I'm leveraging wherever I can to, to try to make a difference and understand that we can connect the dots for people even if they're not ready to connect the dots themselves. So hopefully you walk in a wave here today are connecting some of these dots already. Now, I mentioned about My Brother's Keeper. President Obama launched this initiative exactly two years ago this month. And so, you know, he waited strategically to the second term in his administration. Right? He couldn't do this kind of initiative during his first term because he had to get reelected. And he knew there might be a little bit of backlash. Well, of course, this black man is going to care about um, other black men or other Latino men or other males of color. That's the way some people have characterized it, to be sure. But a lot of the folks around the country, the people that actually make things happen, mayors, community leaders, community activists, grassroots organizations, philanthropic organizations, have literally mobilized an entire national network, an alliance of entities coming together around this campaign for young men of color. And had the, the amazing opportunity. Think about that. I mean, this started off as some little research project 10 years ago. And fast forward like nine years later, and yeah, I'm meeting this guy just because I happen to do work that he, he happens to care about. Had a great opportunity to meet with both President Obama and Vice President Biden and to talk about the work we're doing in the state of Texas. And you know what he told us? He told me and my colleague, 
who does his work with me, Luis Ponoan, he's a professor at Texas A&M. And yes, we do get along, Texas and OT and A&M. Um, President Obama told us, we're watching what's happening in Texas because you guys are leading the way when it comes to young men of color. He told us that. Pretty amazing stuff, right? And think about the awesome responsibility we felt walking away from that encounter. Um, and you know, the truth is, we were doing this work before this initiative came along, but this has definitely provided a lot of momentum for us. And it's continuing to fuel our efforts, you know, both here in the state, nationally, but ultimately it starts here on the ground in the city of Austin, within this region with all our local partners. Working hand in hand with them, working hand in hand with the undergrads as well. So I, I, I wanna kind of wrap this up because I know we're up the hour now. And, and to think about, you know, what are you gonna do walking with you? What can we do to ensure Latino student success? And that was kind of the title of this talk today. Um, well, for one, start immersing yourself more on what the research is out there. And unfortunately, there's not enough. And that's one of, the, one of the reasons why I know I'll never be out of business as an academic in this area, because there's so much more to do. So many questions that we've got to ask, so many other data sets that we've got to mine them or, or build or whatnot. There's so much to do. But the little bit that's out there that, that's reflected in, you know, I'll show you, in books and all kinds of stuff, this is selfless promotion, all right? But my book is just that. It's called Ensuring the Success of Latino Males in Higher Education. And it's not just my book. In fact, there's about 15 other people that helped to contribute to this. I just happen to be the, the first thing on the title. Right? The point is that you're trying to build the capacity of young scholars around the country to, to continue to advance this work. Because it's, it's important that we do it for all the reasons I've already talked about. I think I also want to challenge you to keep avoiding those deficit assumptions. So don't, don't assume, don't write off the kid without first checking to see what the hell the schooling conditions are like for that kid. Right? And so think about the family as well. And this is one of the reminders that I tell myself all the time when it comes to engaging Latino communities because everything ends and begins with the family. And that's probably true for a lot of cultures that are represented in this room tonight. But for the Latino community, Latino families, the difference for so many is that they don't have that college-going culture in their background. They don't have a parent, like I did, who went to college and, and you know, got advanced degrees and all that. They don't have anybody in their lives who may be even a professional. And the only time they see a doctor is when they go literally in the doctor's office. That's it. Right? So they, they don't have that, that, that context sometimes. So let's think about how we can creatively engage families. One of the ways we're doing that with Project Males this summer, because we're never still, we're always trying new things, is we're rolling out a, a, a Project Males Summer Academy where we're targeting parents here in the local. The same kids that we're mentoring, we weren't doing anything with them in the summer anyway. So we put a little grant together, the Cuban Family Foundation here in Austin, and they're going to support this new project. And who knows what we'll come of it, but we know that we're going to focus on family. And then finally, when it comes to this work, it is about saturating the message and by that I mean, you know, go out and talk to the people about what you heard here tonight. Maybe you didn't like what I say, maybe I don't like my tie, whatever. But talk to them about what you learned. That, you know what, there's more going on here than perhaps I was aware of for boys or for Latinos or whatnot. And, and think about this also, that it's, it's okay that we, we, should, we can give ourselves permission to focus on boys. Because it doesn't necessarily come at the expense of anybody else, particularly girls. And we can focus on both. And we've done a pretty decent job of doing that up to this point. And so I often, you know, um, I, wanted, I wanted to end with that, that we don't, this is not a zero-sum context. And it's important that we consider, when we consider issues around gender equity, which we, we struggle with and we still have a lot of progress to make. But we can think about this as yet another way to, to look at gender equity. Because clearly something's going on with our boys. And I need to show you all the data that there is to show, believe me. But this, this gender gap is pervasive, and ultimately it could, could pretend very negatively for the future of our, of our community. I'm going to finish with this story, and, and, and this kind of in all ways encapsulates the work and why I'm so passionate about it. So a couple of years ago, I had to go get tires on the truck. Yeah, I'm a Texas guy. I got the truck, right? So the guy who brings me back, you know, there's a shell driver. Usually you don't talk to them. It's kind of awkward. Well. 
In this case, I was way south. Don't ask me why, but I was way south. We we're going to get on 35 in the morning rush hour traffic. So I knew I was going to have at least 30, 45 minutes with the guy. Young Latino guy ends up, turns out he grew up in East Austin, lives literally a mile from where I live, literally a mile from where I live. And uh, he asked me, so where are we going? I said, well, we're going to UT Austin. You know, I, and part of me was like a little sheepish about it, and that's a whole other conversation for another day, right? Because sometimes people react weird when you say you're a professor, believe it or not. Not everybody's like, oh, that's awesome. No, some people are like, F you, or, you know, whatever insecurities come out. But this guy was like curious, genuinely curious. Like, oh, wow. So, well, we're going to, you're a professor at UT? He literally says it like that. His name was Tony. Tony's like, you know, I've never met a professor. Especially one who looked like him, because he's a Latino from East Austin. He never met a professor in 22 years of his life. He was a high school dropout. He'd been in trouble with the law. He had this gig. He was piecing together, just showing people back and forth to work, right? At the tire shop. And he starts kind of sharing more. He's talking about, you know, my, I got a little brother. He's like struggling in school. He's kind of falling into that same pattern that I did. Where I got that, and I'm trying to encourage him to stay in school. And, you know, he was getting really personal. He started sharing about all his legal troubles. He'd never been in jail, but he had some issues come up, you know. A lot of these young men have issues, and leave it at that, with the law. And, you know, but I could see he was trying to turn a corner. He started asking all these questions about UT and what's it like. And this. Then, then, you know, as we were getting close to the Sanchez building, he was dropping me off. He asked me this question that, I mean, to this day, it kind of sticks with me. He said, is it hard to get into UT Austin? So ask yourself that question just for a second. Is it hard to get into UT Austin? It sounds like a pretty innocuous question to ask. But consider the source. This young man, 23 year old high school dropout, had probably never asked anybody that question in his life because he never felt like he could ask that question of anybody. He finally had somebody, whatever, that he could ask that question of. Now imagine if Tony could have asked that question when he was a young boy, a five, six, seven year old. How hard is it to get into UT Austin? Imagine what that life could have been in terms of the different choices he may have made. He clearly was understanding and reflective in that moment in his life that he realizes that there were opportunities that passed him by. Right? Yet, yet here he was, he had this opportunity, he'd never met a professor, especially one from UT, who happened to look like him, lived a mile away from him, and he asked me this question. Well, we all know how hard it is to get into UT Austin. All of you. Right? And you know what it took to get here. You know what you had to overcome, you know all the sacrifices you and your families had to make to this day, financially and otherwise. The preparation, the SAT prep, the private tutors, I mean, on and on. Whatever it is you all did to get here. Because we all had help. But this guy had never asked anybody that question in his life. And the fact that he asked that question, I mean, it literally just floored me. I'm like, wow, this guy, you know, 22 years in, is, still, is, is curious enough to ask this question because he finally feels safe to ask that question. Do you all follow me? He finally found somebody who could ask that question and not feel embarrassed about it or feel like he was going to get judged. And he also, by the way, showed that he had never set foot on this campus. He grew up four miles away. We take all these things for granted for so many of these young people that we work with just because it's common for us. It's a narrative about, oh, yeah, I'm the narrative about going to college. That's a whole other narrative that we've been fed since we were little kids. But that's also a privileged narrative that we've been fed, a lot of us. A lot of us have certainly been resilient and overcome a lot to get here, and you're going to continue to struggle to get out. But for too many young men, they can't even get to the starting block. And often it's got nothing to do with them, but everything to do perhaps with the set of structures and systems around them. So I talk about Tony all the time, and by the way, I did answer his question as earnestly as I could. And I was very real with him. You know, because he asked me like that. He didn't ask me just kind of like to make conversation. He asked me because he was serious. And I said, look, and I literally broke it down. This is what you got to do. You got to start at ACC because he was a high school dropout. And ACC will take you if you have your GED. And if you don't, you can get through it through the development that. Get some credits under your belt. 
Routine, I guess it's at least a 3.5 GPA and 30 credit hours. That's what UT requires in the hopes that maybe you can transfer them. I don't think he was too discouraged. I hope not anyway. But too many of our boys clearly are discouraged every day. And, and so we do all we can with Project Mails and, and the work I do to, to try to provide a more encouraging voice and an encouraging uh, uh, outreach and support. That's all I got, guys. I know we're a little bit over. And I want to make sure we got time for Q&A. What do you got? You got another question? I know you do. How do you feel about not just like Well, you know what, what happens that I talked earlier about all these insecurities that males have that we don't ever own up to. Another one is that when we get to a campus like UT, we kind of we kind of shut it down. We don't go out and ask for help. We have problems with help-seeking behaviors, and this isn't just as simple as hey, you don't want to stop and ask for directions. I mean, that's one way it manifests itself. But we don't want to stop and ask for help. We don't want to go out and seek out tutoring or academic advising at the times we need, or or go to the Professor's office hours. We sit in the back. We don't want to be seen. We don't want to stand out. And so, a lot of that internal insecurity that we have in terms of our academic confidence, it just plays out in all these different ways, which ultimately are self destructive, can be self destructive behaviors. Because we do everything our power here at the University of Texas to have each and every one of you succeed and graduate. That's the goal. That's why, you know, I know all of our administrators and our support services and student services do what they do every day, right? but we can only do so far, right? do so much. Students still have to go and do their part. And for too many of these young men in college, whether it's at UT Austin, and so you think about UT Austin, I mean, there's high stakes here, guys. Some of y'all are in STEM areas or humanities, liberal arts. It doesn't matter what part of campus you're in. You know, it's competitive. It was competitive to get in, but it's also competitive to get out of here and to think about positioning yourself in the career track. That's the next big thing many of you are engaged in right now, thinking about what happens next. Right, so males, I think, struggle in general with Latino males, in particular African American males, with seeking out that help. And a lot of it is they don't feel welcome. They don't feel like they belong on college campuses. So that, there's a whole bunch of research around sense of belonging on college campuses. And if young men aren't feeling like they have a space here, like they can engage and, and have a community and a family here, it's going to be very, very challenging for them to be out kind of lone wolf style. Um, for me as an undergrad, you know, I may have had an old man who came here and had a lot of support, but I had my struggles academically. And yes, that's probably because I chose math as a major. But even then, um, it was tough. I mean, you know, we all go through it, especially that sophomore slump or whatnot. And there were those moments. I remember having a conversation with my old man. Hey, I'm thinking about, it. and he stopped me right there. He stopped me right there, literally. He so said, I don't want to hear anything you've got to say right now, Victor. Literally. Right? You got to do what you got to do. Go through what you're going through. But you ain't dropping out. Not, 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 not too many of us have an old man like that in our lives or anybody who can be there and not let us go there. Because right? that starts giving us permission to make other decisions that can lead away from that goal that we're here to do. Other questions? Other comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's kind of the chicken and egg thing, right? So <laughs> that's a good point, you know, but the reality is that we do have it. You know, it'd be great if we didn't, and if we didn't, maybe there wouldn't be these other challenges associated with it. But I think people fear what they don't know. I think people fear um, people who are different. I mean, you know, that plays out in all kinds of ways. We see it all the time. So for, for boys of color, particularly adolescent males of color in our, in our society, you know, we could sit here all day and talk about all the different ways that they are criminalized and marginalized and they thought of as suspect as being here illegally. I mean, all the kind of narratives that are out there playing themselves up. So we can't help but not necessarily succumb to those stereotypes or, or narratives, but they're around us. We know they're around us. And we got things that reinforce it. 
Like when a cop shoots a, an unarmed black man in the back 15 times. Right? Or hundreds of other episodes like that that happen every year that we don't ever hear about because it's not on video. So I think what's changing though, and what we see through the movements like Black Lives Matter, is that we're using media now to shine a really strong light on the kind of inequities that, that persist around how we view young men of color in particular within our society. And how those views, however misinformed they are, and I'm not judging, because you know, we all love our parents, hopefully. And we know that we're socialized and raised in certain ways to think about people in certain ways. Right? And a lot of what we do, hopefully, in college is not necessarily reprogram that, but certainly open our minds a little bit to think about other narratives that may be out there. That can help, what I say, complicate our understanding about these issues that we think are maybe more black and white. Because clearly we know there's a lot more complexity there. And that's all I'm asking y'all to think about. That it's not as simple as these boys, Latino boys or black boys don't care about education, they're just acting out. You know, they're just, you know, mean mugging in the hallway, causing trouble, disrespecting teachers. I mean, all those narratives that play out over and over and over again. You know, what if his two brothers, 15 year old brother and an eight year old brother, and if they're both late to school one day, the same day from the same house, maybe because dad didn't come home that night or he beat up a mom, I mean, you know, that's real, right? Plays out all the time. And they showed up 10, 15 minutes late. Well, that eight year old boy shows up 10 minutes late to school. That third grade teacher, or second grade teacher is going to react a certain way. What's wrong? You know, what happened? Why, you know, what, how can we help you, right? To think about that for a second, that reaction. Versus the 15 year old boy who shows up 10 minutes late to, to English lit in high school. The typical reaction in most high schools these days is you're late. Go to the office, get the hell out of here, I don't want to see you. It could be the same kid coming from the exact same household, had the exact same experience. The point is that they're still kids, they're just kids. And for young men of color, they hit a certain age in our society, 12, 13, 14, whatever it is, they start taking on these sort of hyper-masculine perceptions, or society does, of them. Right? That they're a threat, physically, emotionally, we, we criminalize them, we, we put them into certain categories as suspects. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, you, you know, we all react in these ways, walking out and about in the world. We see groups of men congregating. We make certain assumptions about what's going on and what we think is going on. So let's interrogate, let's, let's ask or we'll reflect on why you think that way, why you feel that way. You know, because those perceptions, unfortunately, turn into these big narratives Unfortunately, those narratives start turning into policies and laws and structures and systems that are very, very hard to unravel. You have a hand up? Yeah. This might be the last question or the time. What's your name, Aiden. Aiden. So, you know, you get right at the heart of the issue for a lot of people. I mean, we, we, we have difficulty having dialogue about these issues that are sensitive. People don't want to say the wrong things. They're afraid to go there because, you know, maybe they had a bad experience once before with a certain group of people. I mean, that's, that's what, you know, being an adult is all about. I mean, engaging in this courageous conversation is about and stuff. And college, guess what, is one of the only places in life where you have permission to have these conversations and people won't judge you in the same ways as they will maybe in work or in the community. Because right? it's, it's supposedly a safe space to do that. Right? So, not every classroom is like that, I get it. We're about to introduce concealed carry in our classroom, that's going to create sort of some instability, to be sure, and that's putting it mildly. But we don't get the opportunity to have these conversations in safe spaces. So I think we have to give ourselves that permission to, to say certain things that we feel may be unpopular, um, maybe somewhat ignorant, and we know they are. So to answer your question, how do we know we have these entrenched belief systems? 
I would say you start with the assumption that we all have them. You're no different than me, than you, than anyone else. We all have them. And if you walk away from college or from you know whatever identity development process you're all going through, and you still have those beliefs, and great, that's who you are, be true to who you are. Right? But at least give yourself permission, and we gotta give each other permission to, to have conversations that put us into uncomfortable spaces. But to me, that's where real growth and development and learning can happen. And you're at a university that sincerely values that form of teaching and learning, perhaps above all other forms. Right? And, and so you gotta take advantage of that. If you find yourself, for example, hanging out with the same kind of people over and over, you know, I have. I used to teach an uh, undergrad class, a, a, a um, signature course, <laughs> um, where we, we dealt with some very, very sensitive material, civil rights era stuff. We showed, you know, all kinds of you know videos of people getting beat down with bats and hoses and all, you know, just ugly stuff. It's ugly stuff, but it's also our history. And thank goodness we have some way to capture that history, because too often we gloss over those histories. We ignore them at, at, at our convenience. And so we had these really difficult conversations. And we're talking about 18, 19, 20 year olds, like some of you are, in that freshman year course. But I, I said early on, look, we're gonna deal with this content respectfully and thoughtfully, we're gonna create this space. We have to have educators willing to, to create that space. Not everybody can. You can't necessarily do that in chemistry class. I don't know, but what do you think? <laughs> Maybe. That's true. But, but I think if you start with an operating assumption that, hey, we all have these entrenched beliefs that may need to be re-examined, and you're no different than me in that. I mean, you know, I've got certain beliefs about people. I'm constantly reprogrammed. I grew up in a house, and yeah, my old man is great and all that. He's my role model. But he also grew up in a very patriarchal household where everything revolved around him, <laughs> where my mom had to serve him coffee, meals, you know, on and on, do his laundry to this day. So growing out of that household, think about the entrenched beliefs that I had, and coming to college at UT Austin, and meeting the kind of women that I met. You know, there was a lot of reprogramming that happened in my young life, let me just say that. And to this day, as I'm often reminded. So we all have these entrenched beliefs. Some of them have to do with race or religion or sexuality or you know, the role of men and women, whatever it might be. But uh, if you walk in with that assumption, this is the one time in your life where you can get a chance to to explore that, those assumptions a little bit and, and you know, be safe in doing so. I think that might be a good place to start. Thank you for your question. Uh, thank you all for your question.